So this video is an explanation of the inert pair effect. And this is an observation that as we go down the group groups in the P block, so for example this is group 14, we can observe in the compounds that the favoured oxidation state of elements in that group changes as we go down the group. So in this case, for example, we've got carbon, silicon, germanium, tin and lead. Most of them can form plus two or plus four oxidation states, the exception is silicon, but as we go down the group, we can see the oxidation states in bold, these are the favoured ones, change. So we've got plus four, plus four, plus four. Tin is quite happy as plus two or plus four, but then lead favours the plus two oxidation state. OK, and we can see this as well if we look at groups 13 and 15. The bottom element in the group tends to favour the lower of the two oxidation states. So what's going on in this case? So if we start at the top and look at carbon, now we know carbon forms uh, lots of compounds where the carbon is bound to four other atoms. OK, how does it do that? So if we look at the ground state of carbon, we've got the 2s orbital with two electrons. And then we've got the 2p orbitals, again, with two electrons, so two unpaired electrons. Now, if we look at that and think about, OK, well, how could carbon form bonds? Just based on this ground state, we can only actually form two bonds with the 2p orbitals, because that carbon sitting there with its 2s orbital filled, then it's got a 2p orbital that's got one electron and another 2p orbital that's got one electron. So in theory, it should only form one bond here, and one bond here, say with a hydrogen atom. Okay, but we know that doesn't happen. We know that carbon can form species, whereas we say we've got four bonds. Okay, and the way we rationalize this is we use a concept called hybridization. Okay, so for carbon, we say that, okay, we've got our 2s electrons and our 2p electrons sitting up here. And the way we explain it is we say, okay, well, if one electron from that s orbital is promoted up to a p orbital, and then those orbitals are hybridized, then what we have is four hybrid orbitals, we call these sp3 orbitals, and each one of those will have one electron. Okay, so now instead of just being able to form two bonds, that central carbon has four of these sp3 orbitals, centered around that carbon, and each one of those has one electron, and that carbon can then form four bonds with, say, for example, hydrogen atoms. OK, now this process, this process of hybridising the bonds for going from 2s and 2p orbitals to sp3 orbitals, that costs energy because you're promoting an electron up. But we say that this is you know, readily accounted for by the fact that carbon can now form four bonds and they're four strong bonds. Okay, so the energy gained in forming four bonds instead of two bonds easily outweighs the energy cost of having to promote and hybridise those electrons. Now, what happens if we go down that group in the P block? Okay, so we have carbon here, for example, uh, then let's consider germanium and then lead at the end. OK, so carbon, we've got our S and our P orbitals. Germanium, what we find, again, we've got S and P orbitals and the same number of electrons in each, but the energy gap between those orbitals is bigger. And then as you get all the way down to the bottom of the group to lead, then you've got the biggest energy gap. OK, so the energy gap between the S orbitals and the P orbitals gets bigger as you go down the group in the P block. Okay, and the result of that is that promoting that S electron up and forming sp3 hybrid orbitals becomes more costly in energy. Okay, so the lead is less likely to bother promoting that electron up to form those sp3 hybrid orbitals. The other side of this picture is about energy gain. So we said with carbon, it doesn't cost a whole lot of energy to form these hybrid orbitals and the carbon gets all this benefit of forming two extra bonds around the carbon. With lead, you've got a much bigger atom. OK, so if we consider our lead atom here and our carbon atom here, carbon, if it's going to form a bond with hydrogen, for example, they're both small atoms. It's a really nice, short, strong bond. With lead, 
if it's forming a bond with hydrogen, because the lead's a really big atom, it's a much longer and therefore weaker bond. Okay, so lead's got this choice. It can either promote that S electron up, form these hybrid orbitals and form four bonds, but it costs a lot of energy to do that. And also lead doesn't gain a whole lot of energy from doing that because it forms two extra bonds, but they're long, weak bonds. They're not worth too much. Okay, with carbon, it's easy to do that and you gain lots of energy. With lead, the energy balance, the cost versus the gain isn't nearly so high. So what you find with lead, lead tends to just leave these S electrons where they are and just say, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to leave those S electrons alone, just do bonding with my P orbital, uh, with my electrons in my P orbitals. And obviously if lead only uses those two P orbital electrons in bonding, it's only going to have a plus two oxidation state. And this is what we see. So lead tends to stay in the plus two oxidation state. It leaves those electrons out of bonding and it's those S electrons, in lead's case the six S electrons, left out of bonding. These are the inert pair.